Good evening and welcome to Cooperative Vermont. I'm Matthew Kropp. Eric Davis is, uh, is away for the holiday for this episode, but um, he will be back uh, in two weeks. Um, we're coming to you live from VCAM Studios in Burlington, Vermont, this Sunday, January 30th, 2012, uh, the last show of 2012. And we've got a pretty, uh, pretty exciting show for you guys this evening. Um, uh, we've got Andy Jones and Hilary Martin, uh, two farmers from the Intervale, um, who will be discussing their, their farms and uh, the different cooperative ownership structures by which their, their farms are governed. Um, and uh, one, is a, uh, one is a consumer cooperative, one is a, um, a kind of worker collective, and I think it'll be kind of an interesting way of sort of talking, discussing different, different ways that cooperation can work. Um, but before we, uh, we dig into that, uh, we always start the show with a few, uh, few tidbits of news from around the uh, Vermont cooperative world. Um, the first thing uh, is kind of this, the big project around Burlington Telecom. Last episode, we, um, we had some video from the, uh, the, the big initial organizing meeting um, uh, aimed at getting things going in terms of putting, putting together a, pro a proposal to, for a consumer co-op to buy uh, Burlington's muni municipal telecom from the city. Uh, and that's since the since the last episode has been progressing quite quickly. There's a number of working groups moving, and um, there's now officially a uh, a call out for people to to pledge. The goal is to have a thousand people uh, pledging two hundred fifty dollars in member equity uh, uh, before the before the proposal is actually put forward officially to the city. And you can put a pledge in both online uh, or there's a uh, there's a paper version as well. Uh, the, and there's a website that's, been, that's being put together, uh, I believe it's Keep BT Local. If you plug that into Google, you should be able to find the, the pledge. And in addition to raising equity, there's also going to be an attempt to raise additional funds through member loans of between one and uh, $65,000 for anyone who's interested in investing further. Uh, and the, the, um, the interest rate on those loans, the idea is they're 10-year. And the interest rate is variable depending on how much you would like to be receiving uh, between zero and four percent. So the goal is to really kind of amass at least half a million dollars by the by the uh, beginning of February. So if this is a project that you're interested in getting involved in with, whether just through monetary support or through organizing, you can find their um, the, the information and kind of the way forward on either their website. Uh, they've also got a Facebook page, uh, Green Mountain uh, Fiber Cooperative. And um, you, know, you can check uh, the Cooperative Vermont page as well for further updates of that project. Um, a second uh, co-op startup that's kind of moving forward pretty quickly is the Granite City Grocery in Barrie. Uh, they, they recently passed the 50% mark. Uh, they're, they're shooting for six, 600 uh, equity pledges before they officially launch. Uh, and they are now over 300, so that's kind of making progress quickly. Um, we should be having Emily Kaminsky on uh, later on this uh, in January to talk about this project further, and, um, but it's good to see them making progress in Barrie. Uh, and there's also, th there have been some, some kind of rumblings a while back of a food co-op getting going in Morrisville. That seems to be kind of gaining further steam. There's some, they've got a, a Facebook page going, they've got some, uh, uh, some, some events coming up, so it looks like there, there's some, some serious energy behind this project. It, it's, it seemed to be in the limbo for a little while, but it's good to see that, that going again. So there's uh, a number of different co-op projects that are, that are moving, and th we've also been hearing about some coming out of southern Vermont, so it seems like there's a, there's a wave of um, new food co-ops uh, popping up. Um, additionally, there's an event for people who are involved in co-ops and co-op boards in particular coming up at the end of the month. Uh, it's being put on by the C CDS Consulting Co-op. Uh, it's a board leadership and growing your co-op um, training. It's in Brattleboro on January 26th, so if that is of interest, uh, ch head over to the CDS Consulting Co-op's website and, uh, and uh, find out all the details there. Um, and finally, before we, uh, we get to our, our conversation, uh, the uh, former Secretary of Agriculture for Vermont, uh, Rod Roger Albee, uh, recently published a really great um, history essay on his blog, which is uh, What Series, as in the, the, God of, the Goddess of Agriculture, What Series Might Say. Blogspot.com. Uh, you can also find a link on the Cooperative Vermont Facebook page. Um, but he really sort of digs into the history of agricultural cooperation in Vermont, which, um, you know, Co-ops in terms of history are generally neglected, but I feel like agricultural co-ops especially so. Um, but he sort of goes into so the milk co-ops, um, uh, really does a 
sort of very solid primary source based um, uh, history that going way back and really really looking at what the impact they've had on Vermont and kind of kind of taking the perspective of looking at what's happened in the past and kind of projecting forward and seeing kind of where where agricultural cooperation in Vermont might be leading. So I definitely recommend if you're you're interested in in Vermont co-op history this this essay I think is probably one of the, the key things written in the last few years. So definitely check that out. Um, but sort of in terms of agricultural cooperation, again, our guests are going to be speaking to kind of the newest wave of that. Um, you know, they, you're, both of your farms are at the, uh, are at the Intervale Center. Um, but I was thinking maybe we could start off this interview by, by uh, you guys introducing yourselves and uh, having a um, just maybe a brief, brief overview of how it is that you guys got into, got into the, 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 the field of farming and uh, led you into these, these cooperative ventures that you're currently, uh, currently part of. I can start. So my name is Hilary Martin and um, I'm a grower and co-owner uh, with Diggers Mirth Collective Farm and um, I joined the collective uh, about 10 years ago and just uh, started farming coming out of uh, college. I went to school here at UVM and was an environmental studies major, kind of found my way um, into um, more kind of grassroots economic development and um, was mostly interested in ways to, to um, be involved in community development and, and um, growing community um, and being involved in some way in social, social and economic justice. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of, through my studies of economic development, grew kind of disillusioned with sort of the more traditional paths of doing that. And um, uh, found myself studying a lot of what turned out to be just agrarian communities and um, really felt like agriculture was the sort of original community development, um, that ways that people provided for themselves, um, but also came together in this very social way. Um, so it was kind of this intellectual idea that I decided to try once I finished school and fortunately really liked the work itself. And um, it made me feel like I was, um, contributing to my community um, in, in a very kind of tangible, uh, positive way. Mm -hmm. So I um, was working on farms and then I was lucky enough to be invited into the collective, uh, which I still work with now. Awesome. And what about you, Andy? Um, it's actually, it's great listening to Hillary, who I, I know well and we work across the tree line from each other uh, on our different farms, and yet I don't think I've heard that whole story before, and it's very similar to mine in a lot of ways. Um, I, uh, when I was in college, I was pretty involved in uh, student cooperatives, um, where uh, at Oberlin, where I was a student, there was about a fifth of the campus that was fed in these small student-run dining cooperatives. <laughs> and the Oberlin Student Cooperative Association ran these 60 to 100 person dining halls all on co-op student labor um, because the college didn't actually have the capacity to feed everybody else in the centralized facilities at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were losing money running these small facilities in the basement of these old buildings. And so the students had kind of, starting in the 60s, taken over some of these buildings and, uh, and you could have much better food for much less money um, because the students were doing the work and we also did all of the other stuff. So I got interested in not only the cooking and things, but the uh, actual food buying and procurement. And it was happening at the same time in the later 80s that the whole concept of food miles and the distance that food had to travel, you know, the average food molecule had to go 1,300 miles or whatever it was from uh, the production site to your plate. That was like a, a brand new concept at that point. And so there were some people in school who were trying to get that going. And I was in the co-ops and involved in the food buying thing. And 
we started to realize, okay, you know, because it's us, because it's students making the decisions, we can actually make this happen. Mm -hmm. And so there was a real, uh, there were a lot of people working together to try to move that forward and set up relationships with local producers. And so I got interested in agriculture, kind of from the local economic development uh, angle of it, because it was the late 80s on the heels of the farm crisis where these communities all over the Midwest, and this was in Ohio, had just had their hearts and centers torn out of them as all these farms had crashed and burned and the SML uh, bankruptcies and all these different kinds of things had mm -hmm. happened. And so having these local relationships where it had very tangible economic benefits to the local community, very tangible social benefits in building these relationships between these college students and these local farmers, and also um, environmental benefits in reducing the amount of transportation and hopefully finding sustainably fo sourced and grown food, all of those things were kind of coming together. Um, so when I moved to Burlington, part of what attracted me is there, was, there were interesting things going on in cooperatives here. Um, and so I knew a couple of people that had been there that had gone on and started work in housing co-ops in, uh, in Burlington. I also knew that there was a lot going on in agriculture in Vermont, but I didn't have any background in it. I grew up as a city kid, came here and sort of gradually found my way into uh, agriculture over the next couple of years and, like Hillary, enjoyed the work. Mm -hmm. uh, and started working at Interrail Community Farm, which was a community-initiated CSA. And it wasn't a co-op at that point, but a lot of the functionality, when I came in it, I was seeing everything through a co-op lens. So I would look at mm -hmm. this, uh, and I looked at this organization, I said, oh, it's all these people, these 120 shareholders, and they're coming, and they care about the farm, and it's not owned by, you know, the farmer. Um, it looked an awful lot like a consumer co-op. And so my approach to it as I gradually became involved and then uh, and central to the business was really to see the thing and behave as though it was a cooperative. Mm -hmm. So um, those kind of two interests of mine really dovetailed at that point. And so with, um, with, that, with that, what was that process um, of, you know, it started off as as a community project that sounds like it was functionally a co-op but not you know, legally one, kind of right. how, did, how did that sort of ownership structure formalize? Well, it took a long time, I would say. Um, we, we didn't go directly to co-op at all. And it was only after uh, almost 20 years, actually, uh, that we reorganized formally as a co-op in 2009. But there were various stages along the road we had been part of a nonprofit, the Intervale Center, which is kind of the umbrella group uh, in the Intervale. Um, maybe I should stop and say briefly, just the Intervale as a whole is uh, overseen and, and uh, stewarded by the Intervale Center, which is a 501c3 nonprofit kind of agricultural development and preservation group. And so um, they've done a lot of things to help farms start up in the Intervale and elsewhere, and they have a various different other projects. They had started the composting facility that was there for many years that's moved on to be a part of the Solid Waste District. They have a aggregated CSA where they deliver things. They have a conservation nursery that grows conservation nursery stock. But the big thing they do is they own a lot of farmland in the Intervale, and then they sublease it out to various different farms. So we, Intervale Community Farm, is one of about a dozen independently owned and operated farms in the Intervale, which is all this floodplain of the Lower Winooski, Burling, uh, Lower Winooski Valley in Burlington, mm -hmm. Diggers Mirth, uh, where Hillary is, is one of the other farms, and then there's about 10 others. So within that overall context, you know, Intervale Community Farm, we started off as a little branch of the Intervale Center back in 1990 and then split off from there and gradually I could see, okay, we need more member involvement, we're a CSA, clearly we want to be growing things that people want, but we also, because we're not owned by me, the farmer who's now the farm manager, we need those members to be involved in the governance and the overall stewardship of the organization as well. So we started a board and uh, you know, started to have elections then a few years down the road. So gradually it developed. Mm -hmm. And what ultimately kind of pushed us in the direction was, A, having resources uh, and expertise with a couple of people in the local community 
um, who had some suggestions about things to look at and how to organize. Um, and B, realizing that we were in this sort of loosey-goosey um, middle ground where we couldn't easily leverage investment. Um, we weren't a for-profit company, so we couldn't take investors that way. And we didn't, didn't want to be. That wasn't really what we were about. We were really about being responsive to our members, um, serving their needs. But we were a nonprofit that wasn't charitable. Mm -hmm. And so because we weren't charitable, we weren't a 501c3, because we weren't, we weren't really doing things that were fundamentally charitable. We were serving the needs of our members. Um, and so because of those two things, we couldn't get grants since we weren't a nonprofit. We couldn't get investors because we were not a for-profit. So the co-op model was going to allow us to access some additional working capital through member equity um, and uh, potentially co-op member loans that before we were dependent completely on reinvested earnings and uh, debt to mm -hmm. make that happen. So. We made that transition in 2009 and have been kind of building up our, our co-op membership since then. So now we're at about 60% or so of our CSA members are now also co-op members. They pay a $200 fee to be a part, a, a, a member of the co-op for life. Um, they can pay that over time if they want, 25 bucks a year uh, to keep their equity current. And that is a you know, aggregating working capital that we can work from. And then this last year, we actually ran a co-op member loan campaign that was really exciting that we can talk about later or something like that. Cool. So then uh, what about uh, what about Diggers Mirth? What's the, um, what's the kind of historical origins of, uh, of, of your farm? Um, so Diggers Mirth uh, Collective Farm was started in um, 92, I believe, um, by three people. Um, one of those people, D Dylan Zeitlin, is uh, still with the collective today, and uh, the two others have moved on to um, other pursuits. But um, they were committed to having, um, to starting a business that was a collective, and really kind of a, a business model in which work was kind of the central, you know, value. Um, and it's really, for, for many years, um, legally, uh, Diggers was kind of a default partnership, in, in, like legally. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the collective model, it really refers to sort of how, how we work internally. So um, the way that it works is that a member upon joining the collective um, buys in, we, we pay $1,500 to be an owner. Mm -hmm. um, and then from that point, there's, there's really no hierarchy within the collective. Um, and, you know, all the owners kind of decide on a consensus basis or a rough consensus <laughs> basis. Um, you know, how the farm will work and what will grow, who will sell to. Mm -hmm. um, and we each decide for ourselves how many hours we want to work. And based on that, you know, what we're going <coughs> to grow. And that, that really kind of determines the crop plan and basically our work plan for the year. Mm -hmm. um, and a few years ago, uh, maybe actually more like five years ago, we incorporated and um, just as a way basically to, to, formalize, to formalize the business and kind of take any sort of risk off of the individuals involved in the partnership mm -hmm. um, and kind of preserve the collective for you know, future members. Um, and over the years, they, there have been 12 members total Mm -hmm. You know, at any time, there's been three to five or six members at any time. But, um, and people have kind of cycled in or out. And currently, we're five owners. Um, and uh, we do have employees, you know, but um, that um, we will hire to help us do the labor. But in general, we try to try to keep um, the workload to what we can do mostly ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so, so like a lot of, I know, worker-owned businesses have, 
have this sort of balance between the people people who can who can be committed enough to the organization to be a member owner and then kind of having additional labor. So what's what is the balance that you guys normally maintain with that? Do you have people who will for the growing season work full time, will do a few hours? How how does that work? Yeah, it's I think it's it's kind of shifted over the years mostly as um, mostly as my farm partners have basically kind of grown up and um, basically have started having kids, <laughs> like, but been unable to be like working, you know, 50 to 60 hours a week, mm -hmm. um, you know, each person. And, and at the same time, we've, um, you know, we're not a CSA, we're a market farm. Mm -hmm. so, so we take on accounts like the city market or healthy living or restaurants around town and we sell to them three times a week. So in order to kind of maintain those accounts and provide for them and not just kind of drop them by the wayside. Um, we have um, taken on kind of more employees and on average what we're doing now is the five of us work and some of us work full time and some of us work part time. And then we have, usually we have about a one full time employee and then a handful of part time employees that help, help out on bigger harvest days, mm -hmm. um, you know, just because the way that the harvest works is, you know, we can't necessarily just sort of spread it all out e right. <laughs> evenly across, you know, nice. five to seven days, you know, right. so there are some days that just end up being heavier than others, and so we take on other people in that way. And is that sort of a, um, a role that then kind of is something that you reach into when, when you have turnover within the collective, that people who have been employees you have experience with? become sort of the next, is that how people That's sort of enter the collective or? Yeah, it, it actually hasn't changed that much since I joined 10 years ago. Um, um, I joined 10 years ago as the, you know, a fourth collective member and then um, we had somebody working for us for about three years. Um, and it, it, it was the kind of thing where she was consistent enough where we were, we were sort of like, hey, she should be a collective member. and. Um, that's how it happened with the fifth, mm -hmm. with the fifth collective member. Um, and we actually just, you know, recently we've, we've had an employee and we, um, we actually kind of came to that moment where we decided that she should be invited to be a collective member and um, had a conversation with her and uh, she actually declined membership. Um, just, it's a little complicated because she doesn't speak English fluently, so mm -hmm. <laughs> she de she kind of declined on the basis that it would be sort of too complicated. But because she is such an important worker, we actually cost share with her. So she makes the same wage that we all make, but mm -hmm. it's decided she decided not to be involved in the decision making piece of it. So, but yeah, it it, it kind of evolves that if, if we're hiring somebody full time, it sort of makes sense for that person to be um, a collective member. Okay. But it's, you know, honestly, it hasn't really been, um, it, it hasn't kind of worked uh, in the way that we don't have like a rule of like when we get a new collective member. It's kind of fluid and mm -hmm. depends on um, depends on the circumstances because honestly it's it's really important that the kind of personal dynamics are just so in order to have the collective work in a good way mm -hmm. um, the, you know we all kind of have to work well together and so it's kind of a little bit of a dance that of like uh, deciding that that's gonna be something that the mm -hmm. that we decide to do so one, one question I have for both of you is just in terms of you know, for, for each of these kind of unique ownership structures, are there certain are there certain things that that having that particular structure um, changes about the way that you go about you go about your farming or go about the general sort of operations of the organization compared to other sorts of places that you've worked or what you see happening at other farms? Like, what is it that 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 the that these ownership structures kind of help contribute that really, that you feel like kind of makes it a unique or different experience from kind of the, the, the basic model of the, the individual proprietor owning the farm. So maybe Andy, you wanna? Sure, I'll start. So as a CSA or community supported agriculture farm, we have people coming to the farm each week. We're weird for a lot of reasons. The, you know, I and none of the farmers own any of the interest in the farm and we, I'm a co-op member, other 
people are co-op members, but nobody owns more than that very small percentage of that. Um, and we're also strange in that everybody comes to the farm, which is an unusual model these days for a large CSA. Um, so I think that those, you know, those kinds of things have actually framed it as much as it straight up being the cooperative. Now, as I was saying earlier, I think that they're those structures lend themselves naturally to the co-op business model. But um, for us, our focus has always been on what is it that our members want. And so that's always been my thinking as we're choosing our crop plan, as we're investing in you know, new equipment, as we're building new facilities. Like, how is this going to return either value or enjoyment or uh, further the goals that have been identified by the members. And the members, the CSA membership, had identified these things through its board that was elected of the CSA membership even before we reorganized into a co-op. So I would say that on the sort of the social and, um, and practical level and our choices that we're making, things haven't changed tremendously when we reorganized formally into a co-op in 2009. But I think we were behaving in the way that a good consumer co-op would prior to that, which is to say, you know, all these CSA members are the co-op members. Mm -hmm. What are the things that are important to them? How can we best serve those needs? What are the other parts of the community that we're, we have concerns about? Um, you know, what do the co-op membership want to do as far as affordability and uh, wages for workers and all these other kinds of things. So those were all, we've always been a, a member-driven organization for a long time. And what the co-op piece did was to change the economics of it slightly. So I think we have people that are more, they're certainly more financially invested mm -hmm. in the farm uh, now, but they're also, as a result, there is a, so, a, a somewhat higher level, I think, of emotional investment too on, mm -hmm. on the part of some of those folks. Some of them, they're happy to, you know, pay the two hundred dollars like they might at City Market, and not uh, really do much more than that with it. But some people, I think, it really has given them an awareness that, hey, I, you know, I can run for the board, or at least I might pay a little more attention to the newsletter or something like that um, as a result of uh, of the co-op model. Because you, you you mentioned sort of this idea that you know you're you're a member owner, and uh, full disclosure, I'm a member owner as well. Right. Um, but the uh, sort of the 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 idea that you have many people who have these like kind of small slivers of ownership. Um, do you uh, kind of as a farmer see instances of um, people sort of becoming more involved than they would as a cust as a customer, sort of, or like any particular sort of things that through which you can sort of see that kind of behavioral difference of being a member versus being a customer? Mm -hmm. I think that that there is some of that, and we've always had a sort of a ladder of increased member involvement. So people come to the farm, and one of the things they have to do when they come to the farm if they want, there's a number of crops that are only available as you pick items. So anybody that's joining Intervale Community Farm, like if they want peas or strawberries, or things like that, they gotta go out and pick them. So we've always tried to get people involved in the farm on that level, and what that has led people to do is folks who like that and are interested in that, they will often do a working membership where people get a discounted membership uh, for doing some stuff at the farm. And so then those working membership folks, they're actually coming out to the fields, working with the staff of the farm. They're seeing what's going on in the fields. They're learning more about the production side of things. And what, um, what, what percentage of members would you say are working members? Not very many. We just haven't been able, we can't accommodate more than a certain number. Mm -hmm. um, so we typically have about 20 in a, in a given year. Um, but that's been a great board development tool. So we get then people that have been working members who are interested in, in doing more that then are interested in helping out with the project or an event or maybe running for the board. So there has been this mm -hmm. kind of board development ladder. I think this last year uh, we are doing a major expansion over the next couple of years and so we actually put together a co-op member loan program and I think that's the kind of thing that we might have been able to do before when we weren't a cooperative but the fact that we were a co-op I think made people um, really excited about thinking oh is there some other way that I can contribute to you know this organization that I really believe in 
um, growing and doing new great things into the future. So we were able to raise um, quite a bit of capital through that lending program that was from two dozen or so members that decided to loan anywhere from two to uh, $15,000 for you know, five to 10 years. So it was great uh, for us to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And it really, I think, is a very tangible way that some folks have, have uh, supported, supported it and that that relationship is a little different. Mm -hmm. And what about Digger's Mirth in terms of, um, you know, when we're talking about the, the, the very small slices of ownership in Interville Community Farm, where you guys are a co collective of a handful of people who have quite large pieces of the pie, of the total pie each, um, but still have this kind of, it sounds like, fairly egalitarian relationship amongst you in terms of decision making. Um, do you see sort of ways in which that, that sort of difference, instead of having one farmer and then sort of hiring sort of workers, having all of the people who work there kind of on the same level or most of the people on the same level, does that change the way in which it operates? I think so. I think hugely. Um, it's hard for me to imagine actually owning a farm as a sole proprietor. Um, and uh, so, you know, I obviously find a lot of advantages to it. There are people, I think, that it, it wouldn't work for them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sharing decision making um, about how to run the business and with farming, what crops to grow, how to grow them, I think can be a frustrating uh, project for, for some people. And I think, um, I think some people kind of would do better to sort of forge out on their own and, you know, just kind of make their own decisions, make their own mistakes, have their own victories, and kind of call it a day that way. Um, but for me, I really, I really, uh, I, I think I really thrive off of kind of group ownership and group process. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like I learn a lot from my farm partners and I find that we, we each, um, you know, of course we have our own strengths and weaknesses personally that we bring to the table and so when it comes to div divvying up tasks or making decisions, we, we really play off of those. Um, and um, I find that, you know, sometimes making a decision with a group can be very inefficient, you know, because there's process involved, you have to talk it through, make sure everybody's voice is, is heard. Um, but I think I think in the long run, we, we benefit from, you know, drawing off of each other's strengths. And um, I think it really benefits the farm as a whole. Um, and I think, uh, I think also there's a, um, a real sense of kind of, um, I guess, the, the that everybody brings brings their best to the table, and I think that helps us when we're as employers as well as co-workers. And so, we we really try hard to to value and honor what what people you know bring to the farm, whether or not they're an owner. Mm -hmm. um, and because it's it's very much part of kind of the ethics of of um, the farm. Um, so I, I think that's that's a big part of like kind of the identity of diggers is mm -hmm. is like really valuing people and and what they put in, um, and there's also you know I think I think for me there's sort of this lack of stress as being sort of the one person that's you know looking out for the business you know we have five people who are equally invested in making sure that you know everything's going to be okay and the mm -hmm. gates closed at the end of the day and you know so. Um, I, you know, I think, I think, kind of our quality of life is <laughs> is a little bit higher because we we're all helping each other uh, make make sure that things are going to go well, and it's not on one person to manage the crew. You mm -hmm. know, we all kind of head in with this uh, knowledge of how the farm works, and um, we're not needing to kind of look over each other's shoulders. You know, we all have this. Um, amount of trust in each other, and that really helps propel the farm forward. Well, your, your comment about the um, you know five people all sort of you know knowing knowing that the gate needs to be closed kind of made me think of a um, 
one of one of the big arguments for em, kind of employee ownership versus wor versus working for wages is the idea that when you have that kind of wage relationship, there's this set thing where the incentive is for the the employee to sort of minimize, to do the minimum amount of work necessary to sort of meet the meet the needs, and then you sort of they, the employees need to be monitored to make sure that, and so it creates this adversarial relationship um, versus the idea of an employee ownership because the efficiency of the the firm ultimately sort of the more efficient it is the more everyone including that the employee owner benefits from it sort of employee owners are incentivized to sort of identify identify like inefficiencies and when they do identify and rectify them do you, do you sort of do you have exper experiences like that in which people sort of who who in you know in a, in another situation might not have stepped stepped up and offered a solution to a problem kind of will deploy their strengths or you know i'm not i i i think that i have um theorized th about that mm -hmm. um i think in reality i mean probably andy could back me up on this you know i th i think people who come to farming actually are really tend to be people who aren't just looking for a job and looking mm -hmm. for a paycheck but who are passionate about it and want to learn about it and want to contribute mm -hmm. um, to it these days. Um, and so, you know, I've found that the people who work with us as employees are often just as invested and really excited to, to be contributing to, you know, sort of how the business functions overall. So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think in theory, yes, you know, as as co-owners, we're all interested in, in kind of making everything the most efficient it can be. But I think in reality, when you kind of get on the ground, you find that people who, who are working, I mean, really want to make it make mm -hmm. it work. I mean, would you say the same? I sort of feel oh, like absolutely. that about the people who work for the community. Yeah, <laughs> so we, I mean, we are not a, uh, we, we don't have a collective structure. Uh, although we did talk about it during our co-op transition we had a year or two where we talked about what kind of structure makes sense, and we did actually look pretty seriously at whether we could organize as a hybrid worker-consumer <laughs> co-op, um, <laughs> which I really was excited about, but we looked around, and there are just precious few successful examples of that. There, mm -hmm. you, know, you can count them on one hand of the places that have lasted more than a couple of years with that structure, and so it became clear that it was going to take us a lot of work and a lot of money and a lot of effort probably just to just putting that energy into the structure as opposed to like the work of farming and you know serving the local community and all those different kinds of things and we've been operating in a way that was so much like a consumer co-op that mm -hmm. that made sense so ultimately we declined not uh, doing that but I do think that um, part of what's made us successful is trying to empower uh, employees. So we do, you know, I, uh, we have some incredibly talented and uh, repeat seasonal seasonal folks. Uh, there's two of us, uh, myself and Becky Madden, who are full time all year round. But then we, several of our seasonal people, have been working for you know three, four, five years, and they have a lot of responsibility, and they're totally invested in what happens. And you know, if it weren't for having people like that and fostering a workplace that is engaging for them and uh, rewarding for them to be, um, we would be much less successful at achieving our goals. So I think it does come back to, um, you know, I think the, the worker collective is sort of the, the ideal of that, where, you know, people are personally invested and emotionally invested and financially invested in a very equal way. And that we're a step down from that in terms of the individual uh, control but that the, the underlying investment in heart and you know, drive and passion, it's really important for that to be there, mm -hmm. uh, for us to be successful. I, I, I find it really interesting to hear, I, I hadn't known that, um, that there was a hybrid co-op considered for a little while, because yeah. like, you, know, it's, you dig into the sort of history of thought about cooperatives, there's, there's always been this sort of tension between the the right. idea of the consumer cooperative and the uh, the worker cooperative, and you kind of see that in a lot of the, the bigger f food co-ops in Vermont. Um, mm -hmm. You know, City Market, you know, is right. unionized. Um, Brattleboro actually just voted to unionize as well. Um, and so, within the consumer co-op model, you have that tension between the consumer and 
the employee. Well, at City Market, Onion River, before they moved, mm -hmm. of course, they were their their staff structure was a collective. Okay. Uh, prior to moving downtown, so mm -hmm. they really had both of those things. It was owned by the consumer members, mm -hmm. but the uh, the management of the and the operations of the store were a collective. Interesting. So that was definitely, I think, um, you know, that was a challenging mm -hmm. thing to make it work. And there were some some parts of that I think that were very successful, and some parts of it that were not so successful. And you know, some of it might have been structural personalities, all sorts of different things. But yeah, yeah, it's a it's a, I think it's a fascinating conversation. And there are these two streams of you know, like we're very much about you know serving the member interests mm -hmm. like that's the focus of what we do and the members have a lot of interests like the members fortunately for us the members want the employees to be happy you know mm -hmm. and have good jobs and the members want the organization to contribute to the community and they want uh, us to develop a good educational program for the, the within the co-op and various different things like that so mm -hmm. If that wasn't the case, then serving the members would be, you know, a much different thing. Mm -hmm. but well, I, I feel like the the Intervale is in so many ways this laboratory, and it's you know not n certainly with with um, you know in terms of trying new agricultural techniques. I mean, I know when we went on the little tour over the summer of the Intervale Community Farm, you know, showing us some some mm -hmm. experiments that have been done on the land, but also like in terms of structure. I mean, it kind of seems to create this unique environment in which these various these various kind of cooperative alternatives can sort of work out their kinks and uh, you know both of these these initiatives are several decades old now um, but so kind of thinking about it as a laboratory and thinking about you know the the potential that the the two models that that you guys work with um, to be reproduced elsewhere um, do you know of other examples out there are there people talking about it do you think that there are certain challenges? There would there would be certain challenges to exporting it. Like perhaps, you know, the Intervale obviously creates a very sort of um, very kind of welcoming space for that. Um, and you know, again, you know, you have motivated people coming down for whom you know working in the Intervale is probably in and of itself kind of something that is something that they'd like to do. So you have this kind of extra motivated workforce. But sort of if you were thinking about okay, well, more co more collective farms. Or in more consumer cooperative farms, like, what do you see as the um, the possibilities there? Kind of thinking a little bit bigger picture. Well, I guess there's a few different models on the table, and I mean, I think um, there are a number of organizations or groups of people who are thinking about um, f forming organizations similar to the Intervale, where it's basically basically collections of farmers who share land and equipment. Um, and a lot of those folks have visited the Intervale and try to sort of see if the, the model itself can be exported. And people, folks from the Intervale Center do some consulting around that. Um, I see a lot of uh, younger farmers primarily who you know, have gotten in touch with us or just who are curious about the collective model, people who want to, you know, uh, um, start out a farm I think it's really appetizing the idea of like sharing the expenses you know mm -hmm. to, to start a new venture and um, combine forces work with other people um, I think is is definitely something that's appealing to younger people um, as they're first starting out and so we you know I hear from people here and there who definitely are interested in kind of learning how we're structured and you know how they might how they might do a similar similar thing yeah, I don't know. Um, I think we're the, the consumer co-op farm side of it is, I think, a little bit more of a niche market, so to speak, in terms of where it might be applicable. Um, I think, to some degree, there's a scale function for it to be. I think, powerful. It needs to be of a certain scale, and there aren't that many large CSAs around. And CSAs generally are sole proprietorships like a lot of market farms and wholesale operations too so they're the farmer that have started them and I think that the advantage is that it's probably a, a useful model for people to to look at for these more community initiated CSAs which mostly this day and age are attached to 
land-based nonprofits or um, or uh, land trusts, um, and so there are around the country a number of those places that have a CSA that's part of what they do. And I think in that case, where you really are trying to get community buy-in, um, that it's not a big leap um, mm -hmm. to really say a co-op is a great model for this. I think for an individual, so many people they want to own or they buy their own farm or they have their own farm, unless they're starting from scratch and they're trying to get their neighbors involved, like they're doing with the um, Granite City Grocery or something like that, that's not generally how farms are getting started. Mm -hmm. You know, mostly they're getting started by an individual initiating something. So I think in that case, or maybe it's two or three people or something like that, but it's not so much initiating with the group unless it's one of these CSAs that's already kind of falling under the umbrella of another organization or some external structure. Mm -hmm. And in that case, a lot of these places have found over the years, the two decades or so that CSAs have been around, that there are often tensions because you get the land trust and the land trust board and then you rent a little portion of something that they're doing to the CSA and the CSA wants to do this and then the CSA members are very invested, but they are not, how do you give those folks control without it, while well, the land trust still has influence mm -hmm. or their needed control or the overarching nonprofit does. and so. Maybe actually having it more formalized, where it is a board, so you could have the board and the two boards can kind of, you know, agree on that. That might be a successful tool. Mm -hmm. I think there's a third thing that we didn't mention earlier that uh, is going on in the Intervale that I think actually has some. I don't know if it's more y your model, the worker collective thing. I think probably is more widely applicable than the consumer co-op model, but I think also with potential for wider applicability is. Um, there's uh, Intervale Farmers Equipment Company, IFEC for short, I, uh, has been, what, six years now? Five or six Just years? Just about six years, I about think. About six yeah. years um, uh, in the making. And it's basically, it's a, it's basically a co-op of now six or seven farms that co-own a bunch of equipment, greenhouses, and share the responsibility of upkeep and uh, maintenance and all of the, the costs associated with that stuff. And it's been a great way for small growers, in particular or new startup growers who don't have a lot of capital put into something, to just go out and rent a few hours of tractor time a year so they can do that instead of having to spend money to have a tractor sitting there that they're not using for most of the year. So it's a, it's a great way of sort of democratizing capital but also using the resources more efficiently. Mm -hmm. So. I know both of our farms are members, there's other farms that are members, and we've really worked and cooperated a lot on having this equipment working, uh, you know, taking care of it together, paying for it together, uh, using it collectively, and it's been a benefit, I think, to everybody who's been involved. Um, right, because not only is it kind of this, you know, people share the equity and own it together, there's, there's a financial incentive to be a part of the co-op, but... Um, there's also this this sort of formalized way that people can share information about how to operate the equipment, which is so central to all of our businesses. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we work together to have trainings or um, you know main, maintenance sessions, um, equipment jams. Yeah, equipment jam. <laughs> But you know, I can say I've learned a ton from Andy, just kind of being working alongside of side him and. Mm -hmm. um, Turning, you know, turning wrenches. So it's been it's been a great way to kind of glean information about how things work and, and uh, get more tech experience. So it kind of brings the cooperation going on in the interval almost to the second tier. So yeah, like it does. Yeah. Different, yeah, different forms going on within the organizations, and then but then the organizations themselves kind of coordinating so that so that say like you know each of you doesn't need to dupe if you only if there's one piece of equipment that would be that you both don't need to have total access to, then you can kind of share the expenses between. Exactly. Yeah, and there's a lot of kind of informal sort of cooperative things happening That's too, where, thing. you know, maybe two or three or four farms will go in on something mm -hmm. together. Um, you know, we've shared cooler space or, you know, sometimes, you know, a couple farms will share a small cultivating tractor or, 
just small, smaller little you know things going together where it just doesn't make sense to do it on your own, but mm -hmm. it makes a lot more sense to to yeah. collaborate. With Everybody wins business. with the collaboration, right? So. so one one other kind of question I had um, that again is you know one of these just kind of co-op connections is um, I know with the with the ICF the uh, it, or individual community farm the uh, city market the local food co-op actually bought a share mm -hmm. um, and. You know, they were sort of a source of capital, I believe, for, for yeah, the new building project. Yeah, they had a member loan. Yep, yep. But that sort of got me thinking a little bit about the sort of the connection of, you know, the consumer cooperative uh, model of the farm almost taking that the next step. Like, are there any examples of farms that you that either of you know of in which consumer co-ops actually own and work land? Because it seems like. Um. I don't know if anybody doing that quite showed up, but it. Oops. I don't know anyone doing that uh, straight away, but I know that Pugin Consumers Co op, PCC Co ops out in Seattle, mm -hmm. they for years were putting money into. Uh, a farmland preservation fund that mm -hmm. were, I'm not sure if it was like patronage uh, rebates that people could select that into or something. I don't know what the source of the fund was exactly, or member equity. But they did ultimately end up buying some farmland and uh, some prime farmland that one of their, one of their suppliers, who was a big supplier of uh, some of their uh, produce, um, and they bought a bunch of land uh, that this guy, Nash Huber, had been farming for a lot of years but wasn't very secure. He couldn't afford to buy it. So they managed to buy it through that and they set up some kind of trust arrangement. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's, I don't think PCC itself is, um, you know, it's not a department that's farming it, but they are kind of at the next level of, of saying, well, you know, we want to ensure our supply, we want to uh, ensure um, that there's access to farmland in our local community, mm -hmm. whatever it might be, and so we're going to actually help make that happen by putting money up front to help buy some of the land. Yeah. yeah I don't know of anybody that's actually going out there and farming. It may, it may be. Um, but I'm, I've not heard about yeah. it. Yeah, you know, with, with city market getting a share, it just seems like, you know, a little, you know, dipping, dipping a toe in, so to speak. But, um, you know, it's the ma it makes you think, especially with like kind of food co-ops co that have member work programs. Almost the idea of, you know, if there's if they have a stake in, in agricultural land, sort of having that be something where member work doesn't just go into running the store, but actually sort of contributes to the production of the food as well, kind of creating. Mm. Well, that's well, city systems. city market's been yeah. hugely supportive, not only as you know, sort of through the ICF and sort of that, mm -hmm. but. Um, they're very open to giving loans to their producers, so um, I know they've done. They've and they've been. Um, that offer has been extended in times of of crisis. You know, after the flood, and also just in terms of like seed money. If sometimes farms have gone to them mm -hmm. in the springtime, and um, and then additionally in times of crisis, like during um, after Tropical Storm Irene when. Um, you know, we were sort of in a mad dash to get produce out of the way of the floodwaters. City Market put a call out to their members and people all came down um, to the fields and helped us kind of pull produce out. And um, they're also really supportive of farmers markets, so offering opportunities for worker members to volunteer and do work at farmers markets. Mm -hmm. um, specifically and they've also the Old North End Farmers Market. Yeah. They've also, ho like we've hosted in conjunction with City Market, they've really done all the organization and they've made it really work, a couple of what they call crop mobs where you know, they'll give member worker hours to City Market members um, to come and do stuff at a local farm. And so ICF has hosted a couple of those and we've had you know, 30 or 40 people show up, they're getting two hours or four hours or whatever a member worker credit and we benefit by having a great project to get done that would take us, you know, the better part of a week to do it all ourselves. They can mm -hmm. get done in a day. And they've done that on a few other uh, farms around as well. So I think there is an opportunity for stuff like that. 
sort of the cooperation among cooperatives uh, mm -hmm. in a sense of um, to take it back to the Rochdale principles. Right, because they've sort of acted as like a facilitator of their members who are obviously interested in local food and you know food self, su food sufficiency in the community. So mm -hmm. it's pretty. That's exciting. Yeah. Sort of the possibilities. Yeah, the possibilities really are are amazing when you think about all the different avenues that where they, as a large organization, have really leveraged their member involvement in, mm -hmm. in directly on farms, but then you know these things that are really critical and important in the whole picture, but a little not directly there with the work and all the work in the schools and doing stuff like that with you know uh, farm to school education and all these different kinds of things helping mm -hmm. out with events and yep. it's pretty exciting mm -hmm. huge ally oh yeah well um, we have about three minutes left in the show um, so any uh, any final thoughts you want to leave leave the viewers with before uh, before we uh, we wrap up I guess you know I feel like um I forget one of your one of your questions kind of reminded me or made me think that I you know I feel like collective ownership or cooperative ownership is in the little it's a little bit against the sort of tide or uh, of like the American dream you know like we all kind of want to own our own piece of land or our own business and it's so in that way it's a little bit different of how people have kind of quote unquote always done things but. Um, in the end, I think it really facilitates more people having um, equity and ownership and involvement and um, being able to, to really own the process, and in this case, in food production and, um, and consumption. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like, a, even though it can be sort of unusual or against kind of what we've been taught is the way to do things, it really allows more people access to those things. Yeah, I think it's a really exciting potential, um, but that it's amazing how little of that is that's out there. Um, and I think there's a generally a very, there's a cooperative spirit in a lot of Vermont agriculture, uh, because a lot of the producers cooperate very informally in sharing information and mm -hmm. you know, helping each other out uh, a lot of times. Um, but that actually taking it to the next level of some cooperative businesses, I think, really does have the possibility to make it more democratic and accountable and I think maybe more sustainable over the long term to some level of institutionalization and some level as Hillary was saying of having a uh, where all the weight of the world isn't on your shoulders as the one person you know you can you can see like well okay I'll you now maybe after 20 years I'm gonna leave the collective but there will be somebody else who's really excited and can come in and take my place in the that business then can keep serving the community and it can keep serving the needs of its owner, worker, members. Likewise with ICF, we can, you know, people can come and go, but we can create this structure that benefits the people for a long time. Well, thank you both for coming on and for all the awesome work that you guys are doing. Um, you've been watching Cooperative Vermont. Uh, we come to you live every two weeks from BCAM Studios from 7 to 8. Uh, you'll also be able to find uh, this episode and all of our others on our Facebook page, which is just a uh, search for Cooperative Vermont and you should be able to find it. Uh, our next episode will be um, January 13th. Um, we're a little up in the air in terms of the guests. We might possibly have someone actually from, uh, from uh, Mad River Glen, but uh, we're just kind of working on scheduling that. So um, until, until next week, or until the, the next episode, I'm Matthew Kropp. Uh, Eric Davis has been uh, out of town, but should be back for the next one. Good night.